Hi friends, so this is a look in the dark, chapter 12, The Lens, and in this third part, Theo is being visited in his cafe by Sir Richard Claymore, who got information that he's about to leave. The customers were getting impatient, and Ricky, who just enjoyed the breakfast, said that good things were worth, were, were worth waiting for. All the cafe was silenced by the upper class, distinctive, the upper class diction, except that is for the deaf man who had been joined by a dear friend, a deaf friend, and the two of them carried on with their conversation in British Sign Language, regardless of the sound around them. Theo and the aristocrat shook hands very warmly, and as he, as he left, Sir Richard made a point of waving a very clear goodbye to the two profoundly deaf friends. He was glad that he was a supporter of various deaf charities. Theo had an extra cheer about him as he satisfied his customers and soon the impatient spirit was transformed into the usual friendly one by a dose of the cafe owner's endless charm. Stannis was driving into the backyard as Sir Richard left the cafe and had he known that what had been served up to the aristocrat after his breakfast the Major would have been a little less sure of himself. As it was the usual arrogance surrounded him like a cool blue ice coat. After a day seen to family business matters, Sir Richard drove the Mark 10 Jaguar up Loch Selling Froome and turned the corner to take him to the home of Danny and Carol. He was thinking maybe he should have phoned Sue first, but it was a little late for that, and he was soon standing at the front door with his finger on the bell. Sue was quickly at the door, and as soon as he said a polite, Good evening, Sue, she knew who the visitor was. Mr Claymore, she said, with a little surprise in her voice, C come on in. Mr. Claymore will not come in, but if you ask Ricky, he will come in, young lady. He said it with a set at ease smile. Sue laughed nervously. <laughs> Ricky, please come in. Sue had not blushed so much since she left her former employers in the bookbinding business. She led the way to the sitting room. I was about to get myself some food. Can I get you something? Flustered she might be, but she would be as hospitable as Danny and Carol would, not wishing to let them down. No, my dear girl. Ricky sat on the armchair by the window and smiled. How kind of you are to ask. Do you know I've not needed a thing since Theo's breakfast nearly ten hours ago. But please do not make either of us anything. Well, maybe a cup of coffee, but then we are both going out to eat. But I have work to do. I need to finish. Sue, you look tired and you're obviously very conscientious, which is very laudable. But please leave it at that tonight. A break will do you good. And in any case, it is work. I have to share with you what I found out at Theo's place. She was hesitating, so Ricky went into persuasive mode. Look at the time, Sue. She looked at the clock and it was nearly half six. Her real problem was the thought of eating out with a member of the aristocracy. That scared her more than Stannis did. Ricky continued, all work and no play would make Sue a dull girl, you know. Sue laughed. It was just what her father had been telling her. Ricky followed the young lady into the kitchen and as he drew her out with questions he was soon very impressed with how committed she was to the investigation. He was to learn before the evening was out that this Battersea youngster was not so much an employee but more an equal partner with him and the Greens in their determination to end Stanhurst's work against wildlife. He explained that he wanted to be home reasonably early so he encouraged her to get ready and they were soon driving down Locks Hill and to the Crown Hotel in Froome Marketplace. As they sat awaiting their meal, Ricky allowed himself the pleasure in middle age, a middle-aged man can have of being impressed by a pretty girl less than half his age but without any unpleasant motive on his part. The same way a swan or a flower can be admired as an, as an object of natural beauty. Sensing her nervousness again, he said, Sue, will you please relax? You're just out for a meal with a work colleague, that's all. This is our perk for a day's work well done and it's being paid out of expenses, so we'd best enjoy it, eh? Sorry, Ricky, it's just, well, you're... I'm what, dear girl? Well, you're so posh. I'm a real aristocrat and I'm just a working class girl from Battersea. So you think that makes me better than you? No, I don't. It's not that. I'm just not used to being in company like... Well, like you. Well, I hope we're going to be friends. I think that dear girl Carol views me like a kind of uncle, and if you can do the same, I'll feel most complimented. OK, I'll try. You know, so I am probably an aristocrat, because far back in history, my ancestors were greedy and ruthless, and took lots of things that belonged to other people. 
My dad would agree with you there. He's a real socialist. As they began their meal, she asked, So how did it go? What's that, my dear? He was feigning ignorance. Stop winding me up, Uncle Ricky. I'm dying to know what happened. Well, Sue, your Theo is a very brave ally and he's given some very me some very interesting photographs. The restaurant was not crowded and as they enjoyed a coffee afterwards, Ricky handed her the photographs. She didn't know John Clayton from the television programs, but admitted that at 12 years old it was fairly unlikely that she'd watch those kind of things. However, she did know his face. You do? Oh yes, I know his face all right. About a month before I got the sack, he came in one afternoon asking for the major. He was upstairs with Stannis for a couple of hours and, when, and then when he left, I saw something very unusual. My old boss didn't smile much, but for a few seconds after this man left, Stannis had a look on his face that was almost a grin. Did you ever see him again? No, not the grin. Well, according to our Greek accomplice, he's a very frequent visitor now. I have a friend in television that may be able to help us, without my telling him much of course. I have vague memories of some kind of scandal about him. Anyway, he seemed to disappear from the television, haven't heard him or seen him for years. Until now, that is. I will track this friend down and try and see him on Thursday. Theo, Theo certainly sings your praises. Theo is a very dear man. He's the one bright thing about working around there. I hope, Ricky said, running his finger through his greying beard, that it won't be too long before we hear something from our friends in the Emerald Isle. Hope all is well with them there. So do I, Ricky. I hope they're not in any danger. Good heavens, no. Mind you, dear girl, Carol is on her own territory there. I don't think we have too much to worry about. Over a second coffee, Ricky gently quizzed the girl about her family, and the more he heard, the more he liked what he saw in her. When he dropped her off at the Greens' home, he kissed her hand and said, I think you should get going to work in a supermarket in Battersea or somewhere. I have an idea that we're going to be needing you in the future. You'll not need to look for any work. Thanks, Ricky. I really enjoyed that. I feel very refreshed now, fit for more work tomorrow. Sorry I was so nervous. I know you now. I'll not be like that again. As he watched to see her safely inside the door, before he drove on, she was laughing inside. Nobody had ever kissed that hand before. She could see he was a truly lovely man and was glad she would undoubtedly see him at the Greens again. She was wondering what her parents would have thought about her evening out with a middle-aged aristocrat. As Sue was undressing for bed, the telephone rang and it was Carol Green. They both had much they wanted to share with each other, but both knew it was best not to get too far into that on the phone. Sue just left Carol, let Carol know that there was a new development from the cafe owner and that the aristocrat was seeing to it. Carol assured her that all was well with them and they were both pleased by the obvious warmth that had developed between them. Carol did some gentle teasing about eating out with a rich man and Sue enjoyed the banter. She promised to read up about hen harriers, but she woke up in the early hours and the Oxford Pocket Field Guide lay close at hand, still open at the right page, but still unread. So, Theo knows somebody that knows this man who's with Stanhurst who used to be on television programmes about wildlife. How does he fit into the picture? And how are things going to go from here forward? Thanks for continuing to listen. I do appreciate it. A story is only worth writing if somebody listens to it. And this is quite an issue in the world today, isn't it? The way wildlife are exploited. But of course, the real answer is coming soon. All the very best to you, my friends. Lots of love from Kate and from myself. Bye-bye.